So, hi, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome today to our interspecies conversations lecture. Uh, my name is Christian Hernandez Blick, and I'm the new head of program at Interspecies Internet. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all, and on behalf of the trustees of the organization, we hope that you enjoy this wonderful talk from uh, Dr. Elodie Briefer. This talk is uh, part of an ongoing regular uh, online lecture and workshop series, uh, typically hosted once a month, um, which gives the opportunity to invite leading professors, scientists, researchers, and students to share and present work that contributes to advancing the acceleration and understanding of the diversity, forms, and functions of communication in other species. Um, we aim to showcase emerging ideas and discoveries and host open discussions where the community can join the conversation with ideas and feedback. So today's speaker is Dr. Elodie Briefer. Uh, Briefer is a behavioral ecologist who has been studying animal behavior and more particularly bioacoustics for over 19 years. She's been working on a range of uh, species from songbirds to ungulates and has published more than 60 peer reviewed papers. She is an associate professor at the University of Copenhagen and head of the behavioral ecology group. The main focus of her group is the uh, interconnection between acoustic communication, emotions and social networks in order to understand how emotions influence communication how emotions are transmitted between individuals and influence social relationships, and how acoustic communication affects social interactions. Uh, in her talk today, Briefer will describe the results of a large comparative study investigating similarities in the vocal expression of emotions in several species of domestic and wild ungulates, um, as well as the perception of emotions within and between species, including human perception of ungulate emotions, uh, more recently, Briefer and her colleagues have incorporated machine learning algorithms to investigate the potential of these techniques for automatic classification of emotions within and across species, uh, presenting interesting insights into the evolution of vocal expression of emotions and the factors that may influence cross-species perceptions of emotions. Uh, so now I will pass it over to Elodie. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, and please, the, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction and for the invitation. Um, and hi, hi everyone. Um, so today I will talk about a um, topic that I've been interested in and working on for the past uh, 12 years, more or less, uh, which is basically how animals express emotions through vocalizations. Um, and also whether they do that in the same way or not, uh, whether we have cross-species similarities, and whether these allow different species to kind of understand each other, like perceive each other's emotions. Um, and actually, we're going to start right away by uh, looking at cross-species uh, perception of emotions, which is uh, how you, um, people, can understand animal expression of emotions. Um, and so in the chat now, I'm going to paste a link uh, on which you can click, which will direct you to a website called Socrative. Um, it will ask you for room number. So if you just type in capital letter uh, vocal, then you should be able to enter that website. And then there will be just three questions um, to answer, which I will guide you through. Um, so if you can please from your computer or phone, uh, log in that website, then you should be able to participate in this small quiz. Um, and I'm gonna move on to the website where I can see how many people log in. So I guess that will take a tiny bit of time. Just to explain you while you log in, um, basically there'll be just three questions. Uh, I will play for each question. I will ask you which of two sounds, sound A or sound B, was uh, emitted uh, under a positive emotion. So basically one is uh, reflects a positive emotion, the other one a negative emotion. And then the question will always be the same. Which one of A or B do you think reflects uh, quite positive emotion, which could be happy, for example, in animals. Great. Um, so I think there are already quite a few people. So while you finish your login, so this is what it looks like. Um, I will place on A and then it's on B, and then you'll have to answer which of A or B is positive. Okay. So that's, do you think that's on A? Or B? <coughs> 
is positive? Is it sound A or B? That should be quite an easy one. So let's see what people can answer. You should get immediate, immediate feedback about whether you are correct or not. So we have quite a lot of people that have already answered. I'm just going to show the results now for uh, keeping in time. Yes, that was an easy one. So the majority of people actually uh, correctly answered that sound B was positive. So now we're going to do something a bit more complicated. So do you think that's on A? Oh, I, that was the same one. I'm just moving to the next slide. Um, sound A or B is positive. Do you think sound A or B is positive? Okay, we have 30, almost everyone has answered. And indeed, that was a bit more difficult, but still a majority of people um, mentioned correctly that sound A was the correct one, was positive. And so now let's see if you can transfer um, what you just learned now to another species, which are horses. Um, so again, same question, do you think A? <laughs> Or B is positive. Is it A or B? We have already 30 people answered. <clears throat> I will show the, the results now. And very well done. So a uh, majority of people, again, said that sound B um, was positive, which was correct. Great. Um, so now I'm going to go back to my slides. Um, so well done. Um, I think you already learned now some uh, several important concepts for that talk. Um, first one being that uh, animals can produce different uh, types of calls. So what we call call types would be the pig scream versus pig grunt um, that you heard during the first uh, question. Um, that could be also, if you think about dogs that you might know better, that could be a call type would be uh, bark versus growl. So animals can have different call types. And then emotion expression can be uh, done through different call types. So pig, for example, produce a grunt usually during positive situations or scream uh, during usually negative situations. So they can change call type depending on the emotion. But as you heard during the second question, they can also do that with the, within the same call type. So pigs can produce grunts when they are happy and when they are sad, I mean, the equivalent of happy or sad. Um, and in that case, so the grunts, uh, so it would be the same call type or grants, but it will differ slightly. Um, and then I think lots of you also answered the, the last question quickly with the horses, because maybe you transferred some kind of knowledge you learned during the second question, which was that actually very often in positive uh, situations, calls are a bit shorter. Um, so there might be cross-species similarities, but that's what kind of what we're going to explore today um, together. And then the last thing you learn, which is uh, I will show you a lot through that talk, is that sounds um, can be represented with visual images, which we call spectrograms. Um, and that would be the example for pig grants, where we have basically the duration in the x-axis and then the frequency in the y-axis. So that's basically duration, obviously, is how long a call is. Frequency is how low pitch or high pitch it is. Um, and then the amplitude is how loud or not loud it is. Good. Um, so if you succeeded in the quiz, um, that could be 
for example, because as Darwin suggested, for mostly for facial expressions, um, animals actually express emotions the same way. We maybe all vertebrates or or actually many many uh, animals do. Um, so that could be because emotions have been conserved. So you kind of use your knowledge of your own species, humans, to uh, and applied it to what you heard. Um, or it could be because you're familiar with these sounds. Maybe you've heard pig grunts before. You've heard horses. Uh, maybe you have a horse um, at home. So it could be because you're familiar with these sounds. Um, and it could also be because these were domestic species and maybe through domestication, we've selected animals with whom we had a better uh, communication, like zero communication. So it could be because they are domestic and maybe you won't be able to do that with wild species. Um, and I will actually show you um, what we know about that later on. Um, but now I guess at that point you're wondering um, how do scientists assess animal emotions? Isn't it very uh, anthropomorphic to think that animal emotions and we have emotions and we can measure them? Um, because of course we cannot really ask them how do they feel? Um, so basically what we call the subjective conscious component of the emotions um, is not accessible, at least yet, in animals. Um, and I just want to mention that it's the same challenge that uh, researchers have when working on uh, previable babies. Um, so we're not the only one, people working with animals are not the only one that have that issue. Um, so I will show you in the next slide how we do that scientifically. Uh, but first to explain you why we're still looking for indicators and it's taking so much time, um, I want to mention a bit of history. Um, and that's basically that after uh, Darwin's book, where it was very clearly acceptable to talk about animal emotions, he was freely um, discussing that in, in a whole almost entire book. Um, so after that, for about 100 years, emotions were uh, scientifically well, taboo for scientists. Um, basically, science at that time was um, only uh, based on observable phenomena and not hypothetical entities. So it was kind of not allowed and not acceptable to work on, on emotions. And also um, animals were kind of considered as machines responding on and off to stimuli anyway. So it was emotions didn't have any importance. Um, but you can see with this graph, which is the number of papers published per year, that um, there was then a huge increase and that's only 2012. So now more than 12 years later, uh, we are probably way above the chart uh, with how many people work on animal emotions nowadays. Um, so there has been then a huge increase. And if you, as you may have heard in uh, last Chitka talks, for example, that was um, um, that occurred like a few weeks ago, I think, um, people are even looking at nowadays emotion-like phenomena in invertebrates, um, such as bees and bumblebees and spiders. Um, and so this huge increase was linked to, um, due to several, um, I mean, topics. One of them was pharmaceutical development. So basically people um, were trying to develop medicine for treating human mental disorders using animal models. They were also looking at brain regions linked to human mental disorders using animal models. So if we want to use animal models uh, to, for treating human mental disorders, we cannot claim that they don't have emotions or we don't have any way to scientifically assess emotions. Um, so that was a big push. And another big push was the field of animal welfare, which is now clearly linked to not only how animals are physically healthy, but also mentally healthy. So to know how, if they are mentally healthy, we need to be able to assess their mental states. Um, and I just want to mention that actually, uh, hopefully this year, there will be finally be the first textbook for students on animal emotions. So to, just to say we're getting there. Um, and so this field, especially the field of neuroscience that I just mentioned, so produced some very crucial knowledge, one of them being that um, basic emotions, uh, which this person, uh, this researcher, Panksepp, worked on a lot. So basic emotions, which he, she, he defined as unconditioned emotional response uh, systems of the brain. Um, and he managed to link them to uh, basically um, key brain areas and, ma and map the key neuromodulators linked to these uh, systems. So these systems are seeking, rage, fear, lust, care, panic, and play. Uh, he was mostly studying them in rodents. Um, and he found that they actually um, basically um, the their key brain areas are ancient caudal and medial subcortical regions. And all of that basically means that all vertebrates at least have capacity for experiencing these basic emotions. Um, 
So that's quite uh, settled. But now um, let's look a bit about uh, why we should study animal emotions. I think um, from my past slides, you've understood quite a bit. One of the main reasons, at least I'm personally interested in studying animal emotions is because of um, animal welfare. So animal welfare, as I mentioned, is nowadays clearly linked not only to physical health, but especially mental health. Um, and also the public concern about animal welfare is strongly linked to the fact that animals uh, experience these mental states. Um, so that's important knowledge to have indicators, uh, but also to acknowledge that they have uh, emotions. Um, so now let's go to actually what are emotions. Of course, there are lots of uh, debates about the actual definitions of emotions, uh, but I think something that people clearly uh, agree on is that um, we can differentiate between uh, two kinds of affective states, emotions that are short term, um, and that are linked to a specific event, for example, um, seeing a bear in the forest, et cetera. And then these specific events will then accumulate into moods, which are long-term states. So let's imagine that you uh, wake up in the morning and then you fall off your bed, you don't have coffee anymore, you miss your boss, and then all these short-term negative uh, events will kind of make you a bit moody during the day. Uh, they, they will make you a bit more pessimistic. So they will develop into long-term mood which is then more diffuse because it's not linked to one specific event. Um, so if you think about animals, that makes a lot of sense. Um, for example, a little mouse that live in an environment with lots of predators will experience lots of negative emotions and it will make the mouse more um, pessimistic. So it will kind of expect the environment to be a bit more um, negative. While a mouse that live in an environment with lots of food will experience lots of positive emotions and then that will uh, kind of develop a more positive mood. So basically, short-term emotions, um, they will uh, facilitate response to stimuli, should we approach or avoid something. And then we'll, mood will inform animals uh, and us about uh, expectations. So if the mouse see a shadow, is it likely to be a, a cat or is it likely to be some piece of cheese? So they're very crucial for animals, especially in the wild. Um, and another particularity of uh, emotions is that uh, they are a multi-component response. And actually, um, a very good way to, um, to look at that is just to show you um, that picture. So let's imagine that you're walking in the wood and then you see that. Um, except if you really love bears <laughs> somehow, uh, your response will very likely to be um, uh, first uh, behavioral. So you might freeze, you might scream, you might run away. Um, but also physiological. So you'll have an increase in your heart rate, respiration rates, change in brain activity. You will also have a uh, change in your cognition. So you'll probably pay attention to more threatening st stimuli around you. You will probably memorize that event very well. Um, so basically you will have lots of changes which are in your behavior, uh, cognition um, and physiology. And then you will interpret all these changes consciously as very likely, depending on your where you grew up and what you know, um, you will likely say that this is a fear. <clears throat> and by contrast, if you see that and you love horses, you will experience something completely different. You might be um, as aroused as when you saw the bear, so very excited, but in a positive way. So you would likely be very excited and want to approach the, the stimulus. Good. Um, so now that we talked about the components, let's see how we can do that in a framework. So uh, there are different frameworks that exist, one of them being the two dimensions. Um, so we can study animal emotions in uh, this two dimensional approach, which is basically simply mentioning, classifying whether the animal is in a negative state. So that would be what you experienced when you saw the bear, that will lead uh, emotions that will lead to avoidance or whether animals are in a positive state. Um, so whether, um, so this is what you saw, you will experience if you see the horse and then you will, you will likely trigger an approach. And then the second dimension um, that I already mentioned is arousal. So basically the, your bodily activation, which can be low or high, both in the negative and the positive uh, valence. So just remember these terms, the valence is whether it's negative or positive, and then the arousal is your bodily activation. So the intensity of the emotion. Um, and so we can study these emotions in these two dimensions and also using these observable indicators that I mentioned. So the, basically the components, we cannot access how animals feel, 
uh, but we can measure the heart rate, we can measure the brain activity, we can measure what they pay attention to, we can measure their behavior, of course. Um, and specifically what I'm interested in, we can measure their expressions. Um, so emotion expressions, they are um, aimed at regulating social interactions, so which should make them quite obvious, um, of course, for animals, but maybe also for us. So uh, they are aimed at being perceived by others, so they might um, actually, we might be able to perceive them as one. Well. So there are three main kinds of uh, expressions. So visual expressions, I have lots of colleagues working on, on facial expressions, for example. Um, they could be chemical, so for example, pheromones, and what I'm mostly interested in, they can be vocal. Um, so that can be, as I mentioned before, the call type, so which is it a growl, a bark, uh, but also the structure, how much, um, what's the duration, what's the frequency, what's the amplitude of the sound. And just to mention also what's the main function of these expressions, that's also, so not only to regulate social interactions, but also to maybe lead to contagion. So if we have, imagine a sheep producing a signal, for example, vocalization, then another sheep might perceive that um, emotion in the signal, information about the, the emotion. And this might lead to a mirroring of the state. So what we call contagion of em emotions. And not only between two sheep, but also between a whole group. Um, and of course, not only with negative emotions, if they see a predator, for example, but potentially also with uh, uh, positive emotions. Um, and contagion of emotion is the basis of empathy. So that's the core of all empathic processes. Um, so overall, in a group of, of animals, um, contagion of emotions um, can lead, well, perception can lead to regulation of social interactions. And then contagion, so state matching, mirroring of emotions can lead to better communication, coordination, and cooperation in the group. Um, so now that we, we looked at all of that, just I want to kind of summarize in a scheme, like in a, in a drawing, like what is the aim of my research? That's basically to place calls in this two-dimensional framework. So if we think back about the quiz um, from the beginning, so we could imagine that the pig scream, careful because it's going to play, uh, would be very high here. So high arousal negative. <coughs> then the, the grunt, um, positive grunt that we heard should be quite low in the positive. And that would be the negative grunt, so lower, but in the negative. <laughs> we could potentially place the uh, this negative winnie here. <laughs> and the positive winnie here, or maybe a bit higher in the excitement. So my main aim is to find uh, vocal indicators of emotional arousal and valence. Um, and then also compare them between species. Are they similar? Are they different? And if they are similar, can we can different species perceive each other's emotions? Um, but what do we know about uh, vocal expression of emotions? Do we know that this is uh, this looks like this or not? Um, and so first, what we know are the mechanisms. Um, so we know that, for example, uh, humans, when they uh, when we vocalize, we have air coming from the lungs that makes our vocal folds vibrate, and that gives us the pitch of the sound, so basically the, the deepness of our, of our voice. And then this source sound um, is filtered in the vocal tract, so if I do A, O, E, O, U, I filter the sound in a different way, and that, that produces different, um, what we call, formants. Um, and of course, we can logically um, imagine and, and predict what would happen if we get more tense. So if your arousal increases, for example, will be more tense, respiration will um, be faster, salivation will decrease, and articulation will change. And this will change, lead to predictable changes in our voice. And in other animals, uh, we can measure more or less the same parameters. Of course, they don't have as much uh, articulatory capabilities as we do, but they can open or close their mouth. And all of these changes should affect sound. And except with, the, with a few exceptions, exceptions of animals that uh, have lots of control over their vocalizations, most of them, especially farm animals, they, don't, they cannot control their sounds as much as we do. So we could expect even more direct influence. Um, so there are lots of good examples of cold types um, that change with emotions. For example, we have lots of uh, sounds that are typically positive. That's from a study by Ross et al where they um, looked at laughter-like sounds when animals are being tickled, um, for example, in gorillas. 
chimpanzees, bonobos. And what they realize is that these sounds actually are rather similar to human uh, laughter. Uh, they, they have uh, lots of similarities in the structure. Um, and in rats, people have discovered that when you tickle them, they produce, and in all kinds of situations, they produce very often these 50 kilohertz calls, which is, um, and they produce 20 kilohertz calls in all kinds of negative situations. Um, in farm animals, me and my colleagues have been looking at that also. There are some very typical uh, positive sounds like the pig grunts uh, or the horse, um, etc. So some sounds that are very typically positive. And when I started working on that uh, topic, I kind of, my first step was to do a big review of all kinds of studies I could find to see if I find common patterns uh, with first arousal when uh, body deactivation increase and with valence so when um, emotions change from negative to positive. And of course, I'm not going to go into details with all these parameters, but I found some common changes, mainly that when there is an increase in arousal, as we can predict, vocalizations will become longer, louder, higher and more variable and be produced at faster rates. Um, but with valence, it was very hard to find studies at that time. So that was 2012 um, that uh, had studied uh, changes between, for example, when animals go from negative to positive situations. The only thing I could see is that, as I mentioned before, positive situations, um, usually we induce more shorter vocalizations. So that kind of led me to this question, uh, focus on valence. Uh, do species express emotions in a similar way, especially in relation to valence? Um, so basically, as I mentioned before, with arousal, we have these very predictable changes. I have some colleagues that studied um, how humans perceive different species. It's clear that we can perceive um, how an animal is aroused based on vocalizations across uh, all kinds of um, taxa, so from birds to reptiles to mammals. Um, and even recently, I think last year, that was I have some colleagues that tested crocodiles and found out that they react differently to uh, arousal in, in human infants uh, cries, which is likely to due to predation. Um, so this is very clearly conserved. And now the main question was, uh, my, my question at that time was, what about valence? Um, do I, all animals express negative versus positive emotions in the same way? Um, so that led me to this um, study where we looked at valence. Um, has valence expression been conserved? Um, and then if yes, is cross-species perception uh, of emotional valence possible? Is there any impact of familiarity or domestication? So we look both at the expression um, in all these species. How do they each express uh, valence? Is it the same? Um, and then at perception, so can different species perceive each other's sounds? Um, so let's start with expressions. How do we study that? Um, basically, the way we did was to, um, which is uh, commonly used in that field, so is that to place the animals in clearly positive situations where they emit vocalizations, because that was our main interest. So when they, for example, receive food or during positive interactions, and then we had slightly negative situations, so very short isolation of three, five minutes, for example, or negative naturally occurring negative interactions, so agoni agonistic interactions. Um, and then to know what was the activation, so the arousal, we measured the heart rate for domestic species, and for the wild ones, we just looked at their uh, behavior. And so basically these uh, indicators allowed us to um, assess what was the arousal and then also to kind of validate that we were, that the positive situations were indeed positive and negative ones negative. And then we looked at vocalizations, which was our main interest and kind of looked at all kinds of parameters. Uh, do, do they basically change with arousal or with valence? Um, and I'm going to jump to the results. Uh, first about the goats. Um, so this is a typically negative blet. <coughs> and that's the same goat in a positive state. <coughs> so maybe you heard and you can even see in the images um, that the positive blet is basically just much more stable. Uh, the pitch is not as shaky as in the negative state. Um, in domestic horse and Shevaski's horses, we found um, things a bit different. So that's a typically negative whinny. <laughs> and positive whinny. 
for people knowing horses, this usually sounds extremely logically positive. Um, so positive winds are much shorter and they have also a lower uh, frequency, lower pitch. And then we even looked at Chevasi's horses, so negative whinny <coughs> and positive. <coughs> and here we find very different things. Uh, so positive whinnies are um, lower in frequencies, not shorter. Uh, so they are lower in frequencies and they have more stable pitch, like for the goats. Um, and then between pigs and wild boars, we also found lots of commonalities and differences. That's a typically negative grunts <coughs> and positive grunts. So, as I guess you heard, the positive grunts are shorter, uh, but they also have higher frequencies. If you look at the dark shapes, um, you can see that they're a bit higher in the positive, while for the wild boars, it sounds like this, <coughs> negative and positive. <coughs> and as you heard, the positive sounds much deeper, right? So the, um, we found that they're also shorter, the positive grunts, but they are much lower in frequency. So there is this difference between pigs and wild boars also, uh, in terms of um, how deep the sounds are. Um, so lots of differences and similarities at the same time between domestic and wild species. Um, but now you might uh, wonder, so okay, the, the situations we recorded in, them in were actually, um, we had between, I think, two to five different situations, so that's not much. Is it actually um, can we actually apply that to other contexts? And here we were only looking at grunts and whinnies, right? So can we actually apply that to other types of sounds like squeals and screams? Is it valid also across age class? Um, and the only species in which we've been able to do that was pigs, uh, because we had the, the chance that pigs have been widely studied. Um, so through these uh, European projects called Soundwell, uh, we gathered um, six teams, um, from, so how many teams we had? I think seven teams from six different countries. And then we gathered together all the recordings we had from our past research. Um, so we this, this time we had um, peak calls recorded in all the situations that pigs encounter in their lives. So from birth to slaughter um, that we classified into 19 different uh, context uh, categories. So the, the, the situations in which they were recorded, we had uh, all kinds of all types from uh, piglets, yes, yeah, so from all kinds of, of each size as well. So we did all kinds of analysis on the parameters, but we also train AI, so machine learning algorithm to recognize, to train, to recognize the calls. Um, so this algorithm was trained on the pictures of the calls, so the spectrograms. Um, and um, it managed to actually uh, classify correctly 92% of the, the calls based on their uh, emotion, emotional valence, so whether they're producing an emotion in a positive or negative situation. And even in terms of context, it managed to classify 30, 82% of the calls. So actually the AI can even figure out if the calls were likely produced during uh, in a barren environment or in a rich environment, so during castration of piglets, during handling, all kinds of things. Um, so that leads us to the, the, the main question we're interested in. Okay, so do we have um, indicators of valence that are the same across species? Um, so if I compare all the results of my different studies and more also in terms of literature from other colleagues, clearly we can see that the calls recorded in negative situations, which you see here uh, visually, are longer, uh, but they're also lower and less variable in their pitch like we saw for the goats. Um, so that kind of led us to the next question. Okay, can we train AI to um, to uh, learn from um, all these species at the same time? So if we feed an AI with all these species that we recorded, which you can see listed here, can it actually uh, learn and be able to, uh, is, is it able to classify the, the species? Um, so my uh, student, Romain Lefebvre, he tried that uh, based on the parameters that he extracted from the calls, and actually this algorithm did surprisingly well. So that's, I mean, based on ungulates, uh, but that's, uh, it reached 90% accuracy in classifying the valence. So that's quite promising. Um, and for the last part of that talk, I will move on to the perception side. So now what did we find in terms of playing the sounds to, to other animals and other species? Can they actually perceive emotions in each other's call? Um, and so for that, we usually use speakers, uh, which is commonly used in bioacoustics. So we just play the sound with a speaker, a very good quality speaker. Um, and then we see how the animals react. 
Um, and so we did lots of playbacks, but the ones I will show you is when we tested cross species. Um, so what we did is to play the sounds of their uh, own species, the closely related species, so Shivaskis and horse, and for pigs, and that was wild balls and wild balls uh, pigs. And then we also played human voice from um, Gemep Corpus, which is uh, um, established by the University of Geneva. So that's basically actors' voices saying a sentence that has no meaning, but with a different emotion. Um, so that's what we use. It's a widely um, used and validated database. And so we did that for all species. Um, and so what we found uh, was quite interesting. So we found that the most, uh, what has the most impact in, is which sound is played first, because in our setup, we had first um, few short positive calls and then few short negative calls or vice versa in a random order. And what is important is what you play, the valence of the sound you play first. So for the um, equidae, the domestic and Shavaskis horses, when you play them a negative sound first, whatever species it is, uh, they react more. So they react faster and they walk more, for example. Uh, but that's across all the species that you can play them. Um, and we found the same in pigs. So they react more when you play them a negative sound first. Um, and for the wild balls, that's the only species which we, we didn't find that. Um, the only difference we found was quite surprising. They were reacting uh, with a reaction indicating more negative emotions when we play them positive peak calls somehow, the negative peak calls. And that actually might be due to this difference I mentioned with the uh, frequencies between pigs and wild boars before. Um, and so now what did we find when we tested humans like I did with you at the beginning uh, of the talk? Um, so to do that uh, properly, we did, uh, we launched a pretty big uh, online questionnaire uh, that was translated in eight languages. Uh, we tested, eventually managed to get uh, 1,000, over 1,000 respondents from 48 different countries. Um, and so the questionnaire looked like that. Maybe some of you have actually filled it in. That was a few years ago. Uh, we had all these species uh, that people had to listen to. Uh, we didn't tell them which species it is. So of course they would know if it's uh, um, Suidae or Echidae, but they wouldn't know if it's a pig or wild boar, for example, a horse or domestic horse or Shevaski's horse. Um, so they had a training phase where we, we would just explain them what is valence, what is arousal. Um, and then they had each time um, calls with two questions like we did in the quiz. Um, so for example, for the, the, the questions about valence, they had to tell if sound A or B is positive. <laughs> Uh, but these were of the same uh, bodily activation, so arousal. And then for the arousal question, they had two questions which were either high or low, and we were asking them which one is high or low. <laughs> but these were of the same valence, so both negative or both positive. And then we looked at what was your experience with the species, uh, some demographic questions, and also empathic tendencies, so how uh, empathic they were toward, uh, towards other humans. Um, and these are results. On the left, you have for the uh, whether they can perceive arousal, and on the, on the right, whether they can perceive valence. All these species. Um, the line is the chance level. As you can see, people um, it's don't go much above the chance level because this test was very difficult. It was based on the same call types of runs or winnies. Um, so very slight differences with very short calls. Even for the humans, we had cut the the human voice to very short segments. Um, but we have recognition above chance level for all species except these three here. Um, but overall, you can see there is not much variation between species. Um, while for valence, we actually have a lot of difference between species. Um, and we even have species that are wrongly, like significantly wrongly um, evaluated, which for the Shevaskis might be due to the fact that we had many people that were experiencing horses. So if they apply their knowledge on domestic horse to Shevaskis horse, then they might get it wrong. Um, but interestingly, we were quite surprised by that. We found a clear effect of empathy. So three dimensions of empathy, empathic concern, perspective taking, and fantasy. And then when people were more empathic toward other humans, they would actually judge the um, more correctly the emotions of the animals. We found an effect of age. People that between the, uh, 20 to 30, they obtain higher scores. Um, people that work with animals, they are better, uh, and the people are better in general with domestic than wild species. Good, so now let's answer, um, to finish off, let's uh, answer the questions we had for that study. Um, so has valence expression been conserved? 
it seems that yes, at least some with few parameters like the duration of the pitch um, seem to change in a predictable way. As I mentioned, shorter uh, calls that are more stable uh, in their pitch in positive states. Um, but clearly it looks like arousal expression is much uh, clearly conserved. And that might be linked to mechanism for production that I mentioned at the beginning when more tense, when we, we have very predictable change in our sounds. Um, so is cross-species perception of emotional valence possible? It seems that at least yes for some species, like with a horse and Chivasky's horse and humans and the pig and humans. Um, and is uh, the impact of familiarity and domestication? Yes, there is an impact of domestication as I showed on production with pigs and uh, wild boars uh, producing different calls, uh, well, emotions in a different way. Um, and we might also have an effect on perception. For example, humans uh, are better with domestic perceiving emotions in domestic species. There is also a familiarity effect, uh, especially when in the human questionnaire. Um, and so to answer the question of my talk, can different species understand each other's emotions? It seems that quite likely in many cases, yes. Um, especially when we talk about uh, emotional arousal, which I have talked a bit less in this talk than emotional valence, but definitely for how uh, aroused we are, but also potentially the valence. Um, and um, so that will lead to that might lead to perception of emotions and potentially also understanding. Um, and of course, this can be improved the domestication and familiarity and surprisingly also empathy in humans. Um, so finish off general implication for that uh, work. Um, so expression of emotions and all these indicators that I mentioned, they can lead to developing some automated tool system that can track emotions of animals and hopefully improve their welfare because we can then finally track their um, emotions on farm. Um, but also I showed that the way we, um, so animals perceive emotions in human voice. So the way we talk influence their behavior. So that's something we can maybe be uh, careful about. Um, and then finally, I think the most interesting crucial point is that we are able above chance level, especially with a training, we get much better. We are able to perceive um, correctly emotions uh, in animal vocalizations. So basically we could potentially all become dotto, too little, especially when we um, are perceiving emo trying to perceive emotions of our own pets or farmers of their animals. Um, and with that, just at 40 minutes, um, I thank you for attention. Um, if you were interested in that work, uh, yes, please um, look at our website, so my group website. For the scientists out there, we just want to mention that we also will have a free, um, free online um, workshop on using bioacoustics, the mix between bioacoustics and artificial intelligence uh, in September, so you can submit an abstract and, and register. And I thank you for attention. Thank you so much. What a fascinating talk. Um, yeah, so for the next uh, I mean, 30 minutes or so, we will allot time for um, questions, discussions. Um, so just a reminder uh, to everyone, if you do have a question, um, please use the raised hand um, reaction button um, so I can line, so I can address those questions in sequence. Uh, Brandon has a question. Um, Brandon, do you want to just hop on and uh, ask it? Turn your mic on. Yeah. Um, for sure. Can you hear me or should I type it in? I can hear you. Okay. Awesome. Sorry. Sorry to be the uh, uh, person who's bad at technology. Um, thank, thank you very much, Elodie. That, that was a great talk. And um, I just was wondering um whether you have or or would consider working with animals in a sanctuary context um i actually i i volunteer at a sanctuary myself and 
And a while ago, I'm a journalist and I wrote an article that was based on some of the observations of social structure that the sanctuary director had made in the cows there. And when I spoke to researchers who studied cow sociality sort of within typical farm conditions, you know, they hadn't observed any of the social complexity that the director had. And the director argued that it was because within typical farmed conditions, there's no opportunity. There is an opportunity for their um, for their natural social structures to evolve, and I would imagine that maybe something analogous would be happening with their emotions, where you know different different ranges of emotional development would become possible in places where there is more social continuity and more species appropriate conditions, and so on. So yeah, I was just wondering if that's something you'd thought about. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for the the question. That's um that's very definitely true. So all the goats uh, goat work we've done is actually in a sanctuary. Um, oh, excellent. So the the work on the goats was in a sanctuary called Buttergoats for Goats, which looked like paradise for goats. And we we actually looked at um, I mean, we studied the emotions, but we also kind of looked at their moods. And one in, interesting study we did was to look at whether goats that had been rescued from uh, former um, neglects and very, very bad conditions. And we compared that to goats that had been rescued from just because the, the, the owner couldn't take care of them anymore. So with no previous uh, obvious violation of the welfare of the goats. And then we, we saw that we were quite surprised by the results. We expected the opposite, but somehow the ones that had been rescued from poor welfare conditions, especially the females, they were more optimistic. So after two years of good care in the sanctuary, they were more optimistic than the other ones. Um, mm. But then, uh, so, so the other species we recorded, actually, um, I think none of the species I've been working on were in intensive farming, maybe the, the cows a bit more, but the, um, well, the wild boars and the Shevaskis horses, they were in, uh, in zoos and or national parks, so quite big spaces. Um, and then the horses, they were all in farms where they went groups, so kind of, a bit more natural, um, but I think would be very interesting. Definitely, I mean, there is probably a huge amount of behavior and interactions you don't see when you look at uh, conventional farms. Um, and actually, when I, the other day I talked with a student about possibility to maybe look at the, um, so in Denmark they do lots of rewilding now, so they have these big parks where they leave uh, horses and cows outside, and and that would be, I think, very interesting to compare the, the behavior in these kind of more natural environments than what we find on farms. Mm. Oh, I love it. Well, I, I can't wait to see what you find out. Thank you. So uh, Galia in the chat um, is asking, um, do we need tools to perceive different frequencies that animals communicate in, especially when it comes to lab animal welfare? Um, you know, the I guess referring to how you need the a particular kind of uh, uh, technology to register their laughter because we can't uh, perceive it ourselves unaided. Yeah, I mean, we we can perceive the frequency. So if we pay uh, lots of attention, uh, you might have heard also the difference between the the, the calls I was playing. Um, so we can hear it, but it might be also. I mean, you have to have a very well trained ear, and I think you you maybe uh, might benefit from this kind of analysis we've done, where you can actually look at the more subtle differences and. And also, especially if you train uh, AI, then the AI might be able to to train much better than than. Well, I don't know if it would train much better than a human would. Well trained human would, but um, but definitely you might it might be able to see more patterns that we don't hear. Great, jo Jody's also uh, has a question. Um, it's. Uh... It might require a little more specificity, um, but it reads uh, when testing across species, you mentioned stronger reactions. I don't remember if it was the positive or negative vocalizations, but I was wondering what kind of reaction you were observing. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when I meant stronger reactions is uh, so we basically we observe behaviors that usually indicate some um, stronger reaction. So in our case, that was uh, faster responses and more walking depending on the species. But um, that showed kind of more activation when we were playing first the negative call and then the positive one, then vice versa. 
Um, so it depended on the species, but that was uh, yeah behavior indicating more uh, bodily activation, like more arousal. Can I can I ask for further clarification on that? Sure. So you played first. You played a negative uh, vocalization, then you played a positive one, and you say more arousal on the part of the animal that was listening. What in in what way? Um, yeah, so our design was um, a bit complicated and also limited, um, I mean, constrained by our design. So there, there were some species, especially the Chevaskis, they were studied in very big parks. And so to follow the groups and make sure we can play all the, the sounds we need, we had this design where we had, we were, so we had a speaker playing um, two very short negative calls and then one minute silence and then two positive uh, calls or vice versa, depending on the, the test. And then it, we waited two hours and then we did the same and we played the next species. So if the first species played was a horse, then the two hours later we would do the same with the Shevaski's horse and then two hours later with the human voice. Um, and so what we found is that when the first sound played, um, is uh, it reflects the negative emotions, uh, whether it's a horse or a Shivatsky horse or a, ho or a human, then they would, um, you know, turn their head much faster, um, look at the speaker and also move more. So all these uh, more ac activated behaviors. Okay, so any, any kind of response? I mean, where they, they weren't necessarily responding vocal vocalizations, they might have been approaching or turning towards or going away is that um, it? so it depended on the species but for the horses that was mostly um the 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 speed of the response so responding faster and moving more okay thank you uh mark would you like to ask your question yes thank you about the um shorter vocalizations uh for positive valence and the longer ones for negative um uh, your your work is predominantly on mammals and i appreciate that it's very difficult to extend that to non-mammal species but have you seen or heard of any evidence that that principle holds true uh for instance in bird species or in aquatic species yeah that's a very good question um so we are actually, we're working now also on, on um, parakeets, so I might have that, that answer soon, at least in terms of, um, of precisely the way I test animal emotions. Um, I don't have in the top of my head a, a study where they compared um, um, bird calls uh, between valence, but for sure with the arousal, that's quite, um, that has been studied in, in much more than, than mammals. So indicators of arousal, not valence. Um, there is lots of evidence in in birds, uh, in even in reptiles. In um, in in I'm not sure. I don't think in in um, in fish because fish also make sounds, which few people know. But there are lots of people working on acoustics in in fish as well. But I don't think I've seen anything with uh, related to emotions in in fish that would be interesting to look at as well. Thank you. There's a few more questions in the chat. Um, this isn't quite a question, but Ronnie uh, mentions, um, well, thanks you for the excellent talk and and also mentions that uh, they would be interested in comparisons of body language comprehension, uh, pheromone or olfactory signaling. I don't, uh, don't know if you want to address any of those uh, aspects. Yeah, um, yeah, so my work has been mostly focusing on, on only this um, acoustic modality. And of course, there is also, as I mentioned, facial expressions and other things. And there is a whole bunch of people who look at only facial expressions. And so far, we haven't been mixing too much uh, these two fields. But I, that's what we hope to do soon um, with some colleagues working on facial expressions to actually look at. Um, um, of course, animals use all these modalities like we do. They use all these modalities at the same time. Um, so which one do they use the most and how and, and all, especially how humans perceive um, emotions based only on vocalizations or facial expressions. And if we have both, so if we have a, a dog that is um, shows some kind of positive facial expressions, but then growls, so what do we think? Um, how do we interpret that? So when there is a mismatch, et cetera. Um, so people have been looking a bit on um, 
how animals um, mix these two modalities. Um, so how they, do they match the visual expressions with the with the sound uh, to look at, um, for example, individual recognition, etc. But there hasn't been so much done on, on emotion. <laughs> Um, Tony, uh, in the chat also asks, um, it sounds like the work so far is able to separate negative and positive sounds, but not to subdivide them into different emotions, sort of discrete emotions. Uh, has there been any progress in that regard? And, um, and I was also, yeah, curious if you could speak a little bit more to sort of the theoretical, um, or the sort of conceptual underpinnings of your work you know, this difference between, from what I understand, discrete emotion theory and the sort of dimensional approach that you're taking and what the pros and cons of those are. And and like Tony's asking how that plays into um, into your research. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, so I mean, I've been mostly talking about uh, this, let's say, more simple, like neg negative versus positive, because I'm using this two-dimensional framework. Um, but one thing is that um, first, if we, combine both valence and arousal. Um, so indicators of both arousal and valence, then we should be able to go to all these uh, subtle differences. Um, so when we know exactly how a horse sound like in a negative versus positive state and with, in a, with a different level of arousal, then we should be able to have all the um, subdivisions of um, what people would uh, call basic emotions. So we should know if an animal is, uh, if the horse is in a positive state of very high arousal or low, and and then here we can reach all the emotions that they should be able to to experience. So that's one thing. Um, and then in terms of more, more subtle uh, divisions of of the work I've done, at least on peaks. Um, so I went quickly over that, but we. So we train the AI to um, recognize positive versus negative, but also to um, recognize the actual context of production, um, which we had 19 different contexts. So here it's much more subtle because the AI with 82% accuracy can tell if the animal is in, in which of these 19 different uh, contexts, which are associated likely with a different um, emotion in terms of, of the, the, the valence and, and the arousal. Great. Um, you got some, a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, Ron asks, um, can you talk about the effects of biodiversity um, in the results of your research, if that has ever uh, factored in? Um, and there's uh, some examples that Ron provides here, you know, like in a situation with higher biodiversity, do you think that there would be a stronger convergence towards more universal cross species strategies for emotional communication? Um, or maybe the opposite effect uh, could, um, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm just reading the question as well. So when there is crowding, so in general, I mean, when there is um, when there is more risk for um, for confusion, whether it's um, to recognize uh, when it, there is need to recognize the information about the emotion or to recognize uh, who is talking, for example, in a big crowd of, of penguins, um, so when there is more risk of confusion, usually the um, the info information is more precise. So there has been lots of studies, for example, comparing uh, individuality. So how how each individual sound different um, when when they live in big crowds um, of, for example, penguins or or big crowds of mammals, um, big herds, versus when they live in a system where there is very few uh, animals. And usually there is pressure. So in this big crowd, there is pressure to be more individualized. So they have very clear um, differences between each each of their sounds. Uh, but in terms of emotional uh, contagion of emotions, I don't think we were there yet. To to I don't I don't recall in my top of my head at least any study um, looking at what's the effect of big crowds versus uh, small crowds on an expression of emotions. That's a very important, a very interesting um, question. And then just to jump on on biodiversity, I don't I think it's unrelated to the question that was being asked, but um, but just to mention that AI can also be very useful AI and acoustics to um, assess biodiversity. And I have some of my uh, people in my group working on that as well. So to see how we can use uh, the sounds that animal produce, um, so recording of sounds to know how many individuals there is and how many species there is in an environment, 
and how this changes over time to so kind of assess biodiversity based on, on uh, sounds. Uh, wonderful. Um, uh, Orangutan Outreach is asking if um, you have any references to research being done with non-human facial expressions, gestures, or body language. Um, do you have any yeah. suggestions there? Uh, yeah, there is. A, there are actually a lot of people working uh, first on primates. So um, lots of colleagues I don't have on top of my head um, uh, actual references, but a lot of group working on on. Um, on gestures and, and how primates use gestures to communicate, how they use gestures to uh, to express emotions. Um, and then there is a lot of people working on, on also on facial expressions. Uh, in apes, people, in apes and I think also other like primates, the people have an issue that actually with facial expressions, um, animals can can fake them. So it's been shown that they can can exaggerate them and they don't necessarily reflect the emotion of the producer because they have so much um, control over their facial expressions, so much more than the vocal expressions. So actually facial expressions are not in apes and primates, not a very good um, indicator of the underlying emotion. Um, and there is also work on, on cats and dogs and, and peak uh, facial expressions and how this changes with, uh, with emotions. Yeah, and just to sort of shamelessly plug our, our conversation series, Joanne also, um, you know, references there's a, our, our last talk with Catherine Hobader really focused on that kind of gestural communication. So it's a, a, a good place to start as well. Um, you have any other questions for Elodie? Joanne, uh, do you want to... Yes, thank you. I have a quick question uh, in regards to what is being discussed so far. Do you think there is an evolutionary advantage for humans to understand non-human emotions? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, evolutionary advantage. I mean, in terms of um, here, I don't no, we cannot really talk about evolution, but in terms of domestication, definitely there is one because um, so at least our idea with the effect of domestication would be that we probably through domestication selected animals with which we had um, better communication with. So either that maybe express emotions in the same way as we did um, or or reacted to our expressions uh, better. Um, and we definitely know that through domestication, we've changed a lot in the animals in terms of their expression of emotions and their, uh, the, the range of emotions they express, et cetera. And in terms of, um, if I think way back in when when we didn't have society, I mean, when we, we were living in more uh, natural environments, let's say, I would probably there was an incentive to understand um, species around us in some cases, I guess, uh, in terms of um, hearing alarm calls. For, we know that many species that live in the wild, they uh, perceive, uh, they understand alarm calls from other species. So uh, there are many species such as meerkats that we listen to, to birds when they produce alarm calls and vice versa. So it might not be necessarily linked to emotions, but to, you know, learning each other's communication, um, but that might be also. Thank you. No, that, that that's great. Yeah, I'm thinking about domestication and also um, uh, indigenous people who do describe in many accounts um, an understanding of um, other animals' emotions and how that helps shape their understanding of, of community uh, and, and things like that. So I appreciate that answer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's just people, I mean, people who naturally live with animals, they have a much, much better understanding than, than what we do, or even what scientists um, try to do with all our, our methods that we have nowadays to assess emotions. I was wondering, um, oh, Treasure has got a question here. Jump on the call, Treasure. Hey, thank you. Um, I was curious about uh, the symbiotic relationship between certain species of animals, like ravens, and I hear wolves work together. 
Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, the Ravens will sometimes lead wolves. Uh, I was curious about the relationship between some symbiotic relationships between animals, like uh, how wolves and ravens, and read that uh, sometimes raven uh, will use wolf calls, will actually imitate a wolf to be able to get the wolf's attention. Has there been any like uh, direct uh, study of the symbiotic relationship between two species that are working together that are obviously sharing some type of um, emotional language? Yeah, I mean, there are, um, I'm not sure in terms of specifically in terms of emotions, but there are lots of, um, definitely there, there is lots of interactions between species, super interesting ones like the one you, you just mentioned. Um, there is also examples of um, some species fooling others, for example, um, um, a species of birds fooling meerkats when so they produce the uh, an alarm call and then the meerkats run away and then they steal their food uh, and they, they even learn to imitate the um, the species specific call of the meerkats so they actually imitate the meerkat sound uh, to fool them away and then steal their, steal their food so there are some cases of which is more um, negative like I just mentioned or also probably some some cooperation between species and where they communicate and and they live together. Yes, uh, I see in the chat now that John mentioned the honey guide birds. That's also a very good one. Yeah. That has been actually uh, studied. There's been a few publications out about how honey guides um, work to, to work with humans. I was curious. Um... You know, I think there's, you know, this impression and you spoke to it a bit earlier in your talk that, uh, you know, sort of modern science, 20th century science is sort of resistant to the idea of attributing uh, non-human organisms uh, a phenomenal awareness or inner experience, the emotions and so on. Um, and like you mentioned, you've been studying animal behavior um, and, you know, particularly their emotions for about two decades now. And, and uh, you know, you, you had you had sort of touched on this shift uh, in how these kinds of topics are received by the scientific community. And I was wondering if you could, you know, just tell us a little bit more about your experience with that, or, you know, kind of just share some of your thoughts about that shift in the, in the culture. Yeah, thanks. That's a good, good question. So, uh, I mean, there has been a huge change even, even within my, uh, yeah, about 20 years since I started my master's uh, degree, I would say. Um, but um I mean, first, there is huge more amount of there is a big amount of evidence that is accumulating for um, species having much more cognitive abilities than we thought uh, were unique to humans. We're always trying to find what is unique to humans. Um, so every day, almost, there is like a new study that shows what well, actually what we thought was unique to humans is not. Uh, this species also shows that. And I mean, I want to remind her. A reminder also that there are many species that do things that are humans uh, that humans don't uh, that are unique to themselves. So I think each species has evolved in their own environments that makes them um, well suited to that environment. Um, and we have evolved in another way. So there are things maybe that we do that animals don't. Um, but yeah, so there's huge amounts um, of evidence accumulating for uh, cognitive skills, uh, very advanced communication, um, and also evidence for um, emotions, but also some uh, more empathic processes um, and, and and things that we thought were, were unique to humans. And so I think this shift and even evidence for uh, maybe um, as, at least some con more continuity in consciousness that some species might be more or less conscious. Very uh, recently, there has been a new um, uh, declaration of consciousness signed um, in New York. So you can access it uh, online as well, it has been signed by I don't know how many people now, but I, when I last time I looked, was more than three hundred uh, scientists. Um, where basically, I think people start, um, and all kinds of scientists start accepting more and more that um, animals might be much more conscious than we think. Uh, definitely experience emotions um, and have more cognitive skills than we thought. So there is still, of course, some older generations uh, that don't accept these terms well, or. There is lots of debates about terms also. So some people might say that animals don't have emotions because they uh, refer to emotions as the uh, feeling. So for them, uh, emotion equal feeling. And because we cannot access the feeling, then they would claim that animals don't have emotions, which might be, seem strange because as I 
kind of showed basically emotions are very basic um, response that allow them to know, you know, what to do in, in the natural environment without emotions, they wouldn't know what to approach or avoid or how to, what to expect in the environment. Um, so I think there has been a big shift in the fields. And of course, um, it has some dangers that we might become too anthropomorphic. Um, and in the field, we always have people that are, um, so it's a bit balanced because we have some people that are um, accepting maybe a bit too much these kind of uh, terms and, and maybe not using a extremely rigorous scientific approach. And then on the other hand, we have what we call the killerjoys who try to, each time there is a new study out, they try to say, oh, well, but that's not exactly that because there is this and this missing. So we have kind of a balance, but I think the field is definitely progressing because of there is just much more scientific evidence um, out there. So there is um, even some people that wouldn't have thought um, that same way 20 years ago that now changed their mind. Great, thank you for, uh, for that. Do you have any uh, final questions or thoughts for Elodie? Uh, Joanne? Is it okay if I ask another one? <laughs> so thank you, Elodie. I have a question about the work um, on domesticated animals, thinking about farmers themselves. Has any work been done to understand farmers' perceptions of their animals and maybe even look at farmers who have left um, the, the taking care of animals because they perceive differently than the industry or scientific thought, like you were mentioning, uh, even though it's changing as you're talking about. I'm, I'm, I'm elaborating this question, thinking about Temple Grandin's work on uh, the squeezer machine, right? So her own perceptions and how she then developed um, in her research something to help uh, cattle in their, to, to, to live their emotions, right? So anyways, I was just hoping you could uh, talk to me a little bit about that, if anything has been done. Yeah, that's a good point. So, um, I mean, you know, in our questionnaire, in, in our online questionnaire, we looked at whether people who work with animals are better. Um, that was not, we didn't know, of course, if they are far, I think we included farmers, veterinarians, so it could be any, anyone working with animals. And, and that had an effect. So people who work with animals are better in in, um, in uh, perceive, quietly perceiving animal emotions. Um, I can't recall on the top of my head the results of that study, but there was also other studies looking specifically at pigs and comparing farmers versus veterinarians, et cetera. Um, so I think definitely, I mean, working with species makes a difference. Um, and then for the second part of your question, I don't know about uh, work looking at uh, shifts in farmers uh, opinion but definitely i know that um farmers are more and more also aware and and might be uh, willing to change things um and of course it always comes to the cost so it might be very often if you improve the welfare of the animals uh you will very likely decrease productivity productivity i mean in one hand you will increase it because you will get better um um I mean, meat of better quality because the animals are feeling better. So it might be just more healthy and, and, and better quality. But in terms of quantity, if you want to improve welfare of animals, you need to give them more space and more natural, uh, allow them to um, have more natural interactions. And for that, you either need a lot of space or you need less animals on farm. Um, so that might decrease productivity, which some uh, farmers and obviously the industry would be uh, against. So, uh, but I think there is, I mean, in general, there is, um, very big need for change in the um, in, in the way we we perceive uh, farm animals and what we eat. I think people are. Um, I mean, if we want animals to be have a better welfare, we need to give them more space to be less crowded. Um, and so, um, and for that, we need people to be willing to eat less meat and or meat of better quality that comes from from better. I mean, environments where animals are more free to to run and have natural interactions. All right, I think we have time for maybe one final question. Uh, in the chat, uh, Galia uh, asks, are there frameworks that are emerging for non-charismatic species uh, like cephalopods, for instance, um, you know, that are difficult to, to uh, frame under human-centric emotions? Yeah, that's uh, that's also a very good one. Um, so in the 
past uh, so this week basically on thursday what was it thursday and, and um wednesday and thursday we actually had a workshop um we online workshop with some colleagues um global synergy for animal welfare where we were trying to gather kind of um people who work on animal welfare and and stakeholders and and um to see why uh, is there so much research done on welfare that doesn't get applied. So there is a huge amount of people working on animal welfare and very little um, actually leads to change in regulations because there is so much barrier uh, for that. And so as part of that, we also had, um, for example, Lynn Snedden, who works, uh, is a well-known researcher who works on fish um, pain, perception of pain. Uh, and she also mentioned lots of things on, on uh, cuttlefish. Uh, so, uh, and we also had someone else talking at cephalopods. So there is definitely lots of people working also on um, uh, whether uh, cuttlefish, cephalopods, all these animals first uh, perceive and feel pain, and they do. Um, I mean, there is evidence suggesting that they do. Um, and also people working on their cognition, and they, uh, especially cephalopods, seems to be very, um, um, have very advanced cognitive skills. So that's uh, lots of issue with these. Um, um, there is, I think, a new farm that wants to 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 farm them, which would be a very bad idea, obviously, considering their um, recent advance showing that they are extremely um, smart animals. All right. Um, yeah, I think this is a a good place to wrap things up. Um, Thank you again, Elodie, for joining us. Uh, it's so wonderful to have you deliver this fascinating talk with us today. Um, I, I believe you're the first speaker to join us uh, on the topic of ungulate vocalization. So that's very exciting. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, on behalf of the whole organization, uh, the trustees and our community, we really appreciate you sharing your research with us. Um, this has been such an intriguing and engaging talk. Um, if you'd like to stay up to date with Elodie's work, you can uh, do so online. I put some links in the chat there to um, uh, different places to get in touch with her or uh, yeah, stay up to date with her research. Um, so yeah, thanks again for joining us. Um, have a great weekend and I'll see you all during our next lecture uh, next month. Thanks a lot for the invitation and for the super interesting questions. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>